Good morning. I welcome you to Hill Church this morning. My name is Reverend Dr. Karen Anderson, and I'm filling in for Pastor Lee Benish this morning, who is on uh, leave today. And I welcome you uh, virtually as well as in person to our service today, and we hope that you will be blessed by your time with us. Uh, I'd like to uh, begin by thanking those who are here to help us lead worship today, uh, especially Nancy uh, for her uh, talent at the organ. We want to thank um, our uh, Kyle Neville, who's up there uh, in the sound booth, helping everybody hear us today. We want to thank the bell choir, who's going to bring special music today. and. Um, we uh, especially want to uh, thank our, our guitarist today. Uh, and you know what? I'm having one of those wonderful senior moments. Mr. Harper. <laughs> I lost your first name. But he is um, uh, Russell. I'm sorry. We want to thank Russ today for coming and playing the guitar for us. Uh, and, of course, Deacon Susan Catanzarita, who is our liturgist this morning. We thank you, Susan, for being here and helping us. And um, we're just really uh, thankful to everyone who is here today to support what we're doing. And um, we want to remind the kids, <clears throat> excuse me, we want to remind the kids that we are having Sunday school today, and that's going to be uh, during our fellowship hour. And uh, you can go by and get your uh, treat and come on down. And uh, we have some fun things to do during Sunday school for you. Also want to thank our acolyte today, who is uh, Katie Hall. And we want to uh, thank our... Um, Mark and Kathleen Davis for the flowers this morning that were given in uh, honor of the 40th adoption anniversary of their sons, John and Frank. And we want to thank our um, greeters, Bob Kennedy and Jerry Graham. And did I forget anybody? I think I've got everybody. So we're really thankful for everybody that helps us this morning. Um, I want to remind you to look at the nomination form in your bulletin. Uh, we depend on you to nominate folks for us to be a church officer um, and a member at large uh, for session and for deacons. And um, we're uh, trusting you to recommend people that you think would be good to serve in leadership at our church. Also, uh, check your bulletin out for what's going on this week. We are having uh, our Bible study on Tuesday, and uh, all of the ladies are welcome to come to that. Kathleen does a fantastic job of teaching, and I believe if you can't come in person, you can uh, check in online and call the office. They'll tell you how to do that. Today we're collecting for Meals on Wheels. And if you're like me and you don't bake, I don't even own baking pans, um, you can give a donation. And uh, Barb, raise your hand. Barb will take those donations and uh, uh, just make your check out to the Board of Deacons and put in the memo for Meals on Wheels. And you can give them to her, or you, uh, if you don't think of it, you can put it in an envelope over there on the table. So feel free to do that. Today is the last day that you can turn in addresses, uh, forms for care packages for college students and service members. And those forms are on the bulletin board back in uh, the narthex. Um, the Community Meals Ministry Gala and art show is today from 12 to 3 o'clock at St. Michael's Hall on Center Avenue, and it's free to go today, but there's lots of neat uh, baskets that you can bid on, 
and um, or buy tickets for, and there's a 50-50 uh, raffle. And I know it's fun to walk around and see the baskets. They're really, really wonderful. The winners will be chosen at 2 o'clock. So if you're going to bid on a basket, you got to get there before 2 o'clock. Now, if you like chocolate and you hope to win a golden ticket, you want to be here to see the movie that might be about those things on Sunday, April 21st, that's next Sunday, at 3 o'clock, because you'll hear about it. And that's uh, also going to feature popcorn and drinks. Now, what more could you want? A movie about chocolate and golden tickets and popcorn. So please come and join us. All ages are welcome, and it's a wonderful time of fellowship for our church family. Um, I think that's all I need to share today. Is there anyone who has any announcements, especially any I forgot? Okay. Um, <clears throat> I think that's it. Hearing none, let us now gather together and join in worship. <laughs> Good morning. Please rise in body or spirit and let us join together in our responsive call to worship. Risen Lord, precious Savior, powerful one in three, you keep showing us, us in unexpected places. When we face uncertainty, you are there. When we worry about our tomorrows, you are there. And even in the doubt-filled, lonely hours, you are there. Hear our prayer of thanks for your constant love, which convinces us to sing your praises aloud. Let us join together in our unison opening prayer. Ever-present God, on this new day, we gather to proclaim the splendor of your care for us. 
Fill us with wonder and guide us to walk forward with faith and gratitude. Renew us with your Easter love so that our faith in your transforming powers flow from our hearts. Renew us with the immensity of your mercy and grace as we lift up praise for your goodness and offer thanks for your gentleness. In the name of the risen Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, let us lives bear witness to our faith and trust in you. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us join now in our unison prayer of confession. Risen Lord, Forgive us when we allow the power of the resurrection to fade quickly as we move from the empty tomb to the realities of our day-to-day -day lives. We must seem more like the disciples before Easter than the ones after it, wondering, what now, Jesus? We turn to the world for answers instead of you. We trust other frail humans more than you. We go to their words for answers instead of yours. So many things become Lord of our lives while you become only a Sunday morning idea. Hear us now as we silently confess our sins to you. My brothers and sisters, hear the good news of God's promise. Jesus said, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord 
will be saved. While we may draw away from him, he never leaves us. His love endures forever. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. you now to share the peace of the Lord with each other, and I invite those at home to give each other a hug. Okay, now you guys can come. Somebody going to bring a microphone? Because there's not one up here. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. You can hear me, but you need to hear them. <laughs> How are you guys doing today? Good. You're all doing okay? You look good. You feel good? How many of you got a good night's sleep? Oh, you got a good night's sleep. Yeah, I don't sleep much, but it doesn't really matter. You don't sleep much? Is that a common yeah, thing? I, yeah, I don't sleep much, but it doesn't really matter. But it doesn't matter. Okay. Yeah, the same, same for me, but... Same I, for you? Yeah. You're not a good sleeper? How many of you sleep with something? Sleep with something in your bed? Me. I like sleep inside uh, of like a pod. Okay, what do you sleep with? Uh, one of my soft toys. One of your soft toys? Is it what kind of toy? Uh, yeah, a, a, shark. Special, a shark toy. Oh, okay. I, now, I'll tell you, that's something I never would have dreamed of. I had a teddy bear. But you, dream with a, you sleep with a shark. It's the new age, folks. Okay. Uh, what? I, have, I have like 10,000 stuffies in, in my bed. You have 10,000 stuffies. So I, do you. I, I have like three times that. Yeah. You have, well, we can have a contest, right? Okay. Yeah, do you sure. have one that's your favorite that you can't go to sleep without? Uh, um, no. Nope. No. Nope. You just want them all there. Just get them all. Do you sleep with anything? No, nope. you're a loner, huh? You can, you, you can sleep just by yourself. Well, I have to tell you that I could not... I could not sleep without my teddy bear when I was little. One time I dropped it out the window of the car and they had to go back and get it and everything. And I could not sleep in the dark. I was afraid of the dark. As a matter of fact, until I was a grown up, I did not like to sleep in the dark by myself. I was very afraid of the dark. My sister was afraid of nothing. And we lived in a house one time I was afraid of everything. We lived in a house one time that was really, really big and had a big staircase. And she would get up in the middle of the night and go down that big staircase and raid the kitchen. And she was about four years old. And she would go raid the kitchen, and my mom would find food in her nightstand the next morning. She was scared of nothing. I was scared of everything. And we had a bathroom in that house downstairs. And it had a, a window in it with red stained glass in it. And it made the light in the bathroom red. And I always thought there was a devil in that room. <laughs> and, and I would beg her, if I had to go to the bathroom really bad and I couldn't make it to any other bathroom, I would beg her to go in the bathroom with me. And she'd wait until I got in the position, you know, the position. And then she'd run out and leave me. <laughs> yeah, I was a scaredy kid. I was very scared. But I really was afraid of the dark until I was a grown-up. And then it was really hard. 
You know, a lot of times I have trouble going to sleep because I worry about things. Do you ever worry about things? Do you ever stay awake because you worry about things? Uh, sometimes. Yes, sometimes, sometimes. Can you tell me something you worry about? What might you worry about? That I'll never get any sleep. That you'll never get any sleep? OK, yeah. Hey, do you guys ever worry that you'll never get any sleep? Yeah, sometimes you get where you can't go to sleep and you think, I'm never going to go to sleep and i got to get up and i got to do this. Yeah. Anything else you worry about? No? Never worry about anything. Never worry about your parents? Sometimes, yeah. Never worry about school? Yeah. Well, I think we all worry about something at different times in our lives. We have people we love that we're concerned about. Ever been concerned about your parents when they're sick? Yeah, yeah. Or maybe maybe a friend that you've had a fight with? You ever worry about that? And are we ever going to be friends again and everything? And sometimes that keeps me awake when that happens. So I want to give you something today to help you if you ever have worries. Because the Bible tells us that if we have anything in our hearts that's keeping us awake, anything that's worrying us, or even if it's not keeping us awake, maybe if it's just something that we're concerned about, something that we're just can't get over, or, or just really people that we're concerned about. Maybe it's somebody we love that's really, really sick, or somebody's going on a trip, and we're really worried that they're going to be safe. We can take it to God, and we can trust God. But sometimes I need a little help when it comes to trusting God. So I made for myself something I call a God box. And so I brought some stuff for you to make a God box. And if you look at here, what does it say on there? It says, I trust God. Because, you know, as much as we love the people in our families and in our lives, God loves them more. He loves them more. And he can do more for them than we can ever do. He has more power to change things than we do. He can be with them when we can't. So what this God box is, is I have one at my house, is I write down on a piece of paper, just a little piece of paper, whatever it is I'm worrying about. Like, when my son was in Iraq, or when my daughter was having a baby, and I couldn't do anything you know, to help, I would write down their name on here, and I would put it in my God box. And that was my way of saying, OK, God, they're in your hands. And I'm going to trust you to take care of them. And I would just keep my God box on my dresser or in my room. And whenever something would come up that I was worried about or thinking about, especially something I couldn't do anything about, I would write it down and put it in my God box. And that was my way of saying, OK, God, you're taking care of it, so I don't have to worry about it. I know you've got it. I trust you. And that's what it says on here. I trust God. So I'm going to give each of you a God box with a couple of pieces of paper. And you can take these home, or you can take them to Sunday school if you stay for Sunday school. And if we have time, you can decorate them, because they're not very pretty right now. And that's why I picked these, so you could decorate them. Because they're nicer if you put your own decorations on them. All right, so let's, let's pray about trusting God, okay? Can we do that? Will you, will you join me? Heavenly Father, we thank you that you love us and you love the people that we love. 
and we can trust you to take care of them and to take care of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Let us pray. Living God, with joy we celebrate the presence of the risen word. Open our hearts by your Holy Spirit so that we may proclaim the good news of eternal and abundant life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. Our reading from the Psalms today is Psalm 4, verses 1 through 8, from the New International Version. In the beginning of this psalm, David acknowledges that God is the source of his righteousness. He recognizes that God's righteousness is perfect and unblemished, and it is from God that he receives relief during times of distress. Then he goes on to express his unwavering trust in God. Despite challenging circumstances, he confidently lies down to sleep, knowing that God is his protector. The peace he experiences comes from relying on the Lord's faithfulness. Let's listen to God's message for us in the Psalms. Answer me when I call to you, my righteous God. Give me relief from my distress. Have mercy on me and hear my prayer. How long will you people turn my glory into shame? How long will you love delusions and seek false gods? Know that the Lord has set apart his faithful servant for himself. The Lord hears when I call to him. Tremble and do not sin. When you are in your bed, search your hearts and be silent. Offer the sacrifices of the righteous and trust the Lord. Many, Lord, are asking, who will bring us prosperity? Let the light of your face shine on us. Fill my heart with joy when we, when, fill my heart with joy when their grain and new wine, new wine abounds. In peace I will lay down and sleep for you alone, Lord, Make me dwell in safety. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. While everyone gets in place, you see we have some multitaskers around here. We are so pleased this morning to have Russell Harper. We all call him Russ play with us. As you will hear, this is a very Spanish number, and it is meant to have a guitar. We're lucky to have him and his family, who I'm sure have supported him in all that he's been doing these weeks with these chords. But thank you so much, Russ. We want to thank you, and for Karen for playing on both sides of the bench here.
I want to thank uh, Nancy and my fellow bell ringers for being here this morning and for sharing that. We worked hard on that, <laughs> and it's fun. We, we really are blessed to be here. So now we're going to the New Testament. I chose, rather than a gospel reading, to read uh, from Acts. This is at the first part of Acts, um, and it's a story about Peter and John. Peter's the main character here. We're going to end the, read the end of the story first, and then we'll, I'll give you a little background on what happened beforehand after we read it. Let's listen as God speaks to us through his word. When Peter saw this, he said to them, Fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate, though he decided to let him go. You disowned the holy and righteous one and asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him, as you can all see. Now, fellow Israelites, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders. But this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Messiah would suffer. Repent, then, and turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. This is the word of God. Thanks be God. The scriptures that I just read is like coming in at the end of the movie or reading the end of the book first. So what we have to do now is find out what happened at the beginning of the story. Peter and John had gone up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour, it says, earlier in the scripture. And at that time, there was a man there 
who had been carried to the gate of the temple and laid there every day, hoping that people would give him money as he begged. He had been lame since birth, and the gate he laid at was one of the most popular ones. It was so amazing and gorgeous that they called it the beautiful gate. And he hoped to get enough money to survive on. Because you see, he had no other way to make a living. He couldn't walk. He couldn't do anything. Now, he was an outcast. He wasn't allowed to go into the temple because no one who was in any way disabled or imperfect could go on to the temple grounds. Now, scholars point out that Peter and John were not going to the temple at the hour when they had sacrifices being offered. And that was intentional because they knew that the sacrificial system that was in place had already been fulfilled. The sacrifices weren't necessary anymore. Why? Because the ultimate sacrifice had already been made on the cross. Jesus was that sacrifice. Calvin had a little different slant on it. He said that they went up there to pray according to the Jewish law because it was a good time to do evangelism. And there'd be a lot of people there and they could talk to them about the gospel and about Jesus and spread the good news. Now, ironically, this was at the ninth hour, the scripture says, which was exactly the same hour that the Easter story tells us that Jesus said in John 19.30, it is finished. Coincidence? Not to the gospel writer. Now, you have to imagine the scene. The man has laid there day after day of his life, hoping that as the people went in, the beautiful gate, the gate that was so beautiful because it was made out of Corinthian brass, 75 feet high with double doors, so beautiful that they say it was more beautiful than if it had been covered with silver and gold and people going in and out want to make a good impression on God as they go in to ask for sacrifices for their sins. So one of the ways that Jewish law told them they could do that is by giving money to the crippled man. So he's playing on their sense of guilt and their need for charity. And he's laying there hoping somebody's going to notice him and feel led to give him a little something to help him make it through. And then Peter and John come up to him. And Peter says, look at us. Well, of course he gave them his attention because he wanted something from them. They they wanted him he, to look at him. So he's like, yeah, what? What are you going to give me? Why do you want me to look at you? How much is it going to be? Will it be enough for me to get a meal, to get some food? And he's waiting expectantly to see what they're going to put in his hands. And then Peter says something strange to him. Silver and gold I do not have, but what I do uh, have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Now, what do you think is going through his head by that time? What? 
If I could walk, I wouldn't be here. If I could stand up, I wouldn't be here. What in the heck are you talking about? That's not going to help me. And we don't even know that he knows who Jesus is. For all we know, he could have thought the guy was talking gibberish to him. But Peter reaches out his hand and lifts him up. And he took it. And it was as if Jesus himself put out his hand. How many of you noticed the picture at the beginning of the service? Can you picture that? That could have been the lame man right there. And for that second, that minute, whatever it was, Jesus reached out his hand through Peter and raised that man to his feet. And he realized that there was strength in his legs that could hold him. And can you imagine what that felt like to take those first tentative steps, probably holding tightly onto Peter and realizing he could walk, he could move. And the next thing he knew, he was leaping ecstatically. Now, was that what he expected? No. It was more. It was more than he ever expected. Was it less? No. Because if Peter had given him money, silver or gold, it wouldn't have lasted forever, would it? And after he had bought his food or done whatever he had with that money, he would have been right back there begging some more, wouldn't he? But Peter gave him a new life, didn't he? He gave him a new life when he did that. How many times has God not given us what we expected, maybe what we had asked for, but what ended up to be even more than we expected? You see, what Peter had then was the spiritual gift of discernment to know what this man actually needed and the ability to give it to him. In Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 4 through 11, God talks, or the Bible talks about, Peter, uh, Paul talks about the different kinds of gifts that God gives us. It says, there are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. Now, each one of the manifestations of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one, there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom. To another, a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by that one Spirit. Peter was given a message of knowledge and, a message, uh, and the gift of faith and healing by the Spirit of God. And he acknowledges that. He says to those people around, I didn't do this. Jesus did. He received a supernatural ability to trust God in a particular situation to be able to bring healing to this man. He had to trust God before he could ever 
reach out his hand and say, stand up, stand up. God calls us all to do different things. We all have different gifts, but we have to trust God to provide us with the ability to do them. There is not one person within the sound of my voice today who does not have a spiritual gift through the... God has called each one of us to serve him. But we have to trust him and obey him in order to do it. Do we do that? Or do we sit there and argue with God about what we can and cannot do? Do we sit around and go, but God, that's not me. I'm too shy. I don't have enough money. I'm not a leader. I'm not the smartest person. Do you remember what Peter was like before the resurrection? He was stubborn and doubtful. He had a hard time staying within the lines. He pushed at Jesus. Remember the story of Monday, Thursday, when Jesus wanted to wash his feet? Peter said, "Uh uh-uh, no, mm, sorry, can't do that. And of course, he denied him. Oh, and let's not forget cutting off the slave's ear. This was Peter's reaction to things. This is the man that stood and preached on Pentecost. And this is the man who healed the lame man. Now he's not only healed the lame man, but he is preaching to those who are gathered around. They go from where he is healed into the temple. The man is so excited. He can go into the temple now. And he's leaping and jumping and running around telling everybody, look at me, look at me, look at me, look what happened. And they're all going, isn't that the guy that was just sitting out there that we've been seeing every day for how long? Remember when he was just a little guy and he was out there begging? And They're all looking at Peter going, how in the heck did you do that? And he says, "Uh -uh, uh-uh, no. It's not me. It's not me that did this. It's Jesus. Jesus did this through me. Through me. And he says, now I know who you are. I remember what you did to Jesus. I remember that you didn't recognize who he was. As a matter of fact, even even Pilate wanted to let him go. He knew he was special. But you told Pilate to let the murderer go and to kill Jesus. I know who you guys are. But guess what? Jesus didn't stay dead because that wasn't God's plan. And because he didn't stay dead, you, who wanted him dead, can be saved. Now, if that's not a miracle, what is? You who put him on the cross, God loves enough to forgive your sins. Now, isn't that amazing? But you have to believe enough to accept him 
as your Savior. You have to believe that when he died on that cross, it was for you and that he was the Messiah who died for you. That's his challenge to them. Will you believe it? Will you now believe that Jesus is who he said he was? Will you believe it? Will you trust in it? You see, there's where the rubber hits the road. Will you believe and trust in it? I always claimed to be a Christian from the time I was about 10 years old. Claimed to have faith. About 50 years ago, when my daughter Jen was born, I kind of had a little pinch, nudge about just what did I believe. Um, Jennifer was in a planned pregnancy. My sister and I fought constantly growing up. We're only 22 months apart. And I always thought that's why we fought, was we were too close in age. So I always wanted my kids about four years apart. Well, when Jonathan was 11 months old, I got pregnant. And uh, they were going to be four years apart. <laughs> and uh, I wasn't exactly thrilled, and, uh, but I got over it. And when I had her, I was so excited to have a little girl. And she had blue eyes and blonde hair, and Jonathan was a brown-eyed, br brown-haired boy. And I said to the pastor when he came to visit me, it's like I sent God a mail order, and he gave me exactly what I wanted. I can't believe it. And he looked at me, and he said, Karen, why can't you believe that God would give you what you wanted? And that kind of set me back. Here I am supposed to be a believer, and he challenged me. Why wouldn't you believe that God would give you what you wanted? It made me think, what do I believe about God? Over the years, I've been challenged about that. What do I believe about my God? And I would kind of like to challenge you today to think about what you believe about God, about Jesus. Who is your God? What do you believe? What do you believe about Jesus' death and resurrection? What's it got to do with you? What does it have to do with you? Is it a historical event? Is it a means of your eternal salvation, kind of like an insurance policy so that you're guaranteed you're going to go to heaven and pass through those pearly gates, which for you is the end of the story and otherwise is not relevant to the rest of your life? Okay, got that checked off. Now I can go ahead and do my thing. Do you believe Jesus is alive today? That's one that gets me. If I believe Jesus is alive and with me 24-7, oh my gosh, that means he hears what I say and what I do. Sometimes I don't want that. I'd be embarrassed. What really would embarrass me is knowing that he knows what I think. But that is what Paul and Peter and John believed. Do you believe what Peter said and, and because of it that Jesus is working in and through us so that we can do things that we can't even imagine? Do you believe that? Because isn't that what Peter said? Peter said, I didn't do this. I mean, you get the feeling Peter never imagined himself healing this man to walk. But he said, I did it because Jesus is working in and through me. Do you believe that Jesus can work in you to do things that you can't even imagine? 
think of something in your life that you would like to change. Maybe it's even something simple like, you know, I'd like to have more energy. I'd like to have more energy. Can Jesus change that? I'd like to be a better whatever. Can Jesus change that? If Jesus can make a healer out of Peter, who could deny Jesus three times, what can Jesus do in your life? Do you believe that you can trust God with every single thing in your life? Every single thing in your life. Every person in your life. One time when my son was a baby, my sister, who's an agnostic, said to me, Karen, you believe God cares every time you change Jonathan's diaper? I said, yeah, I do. Here's the big question. Is God not only your Savior, is Jesus not only your Savior, but Lord of your life? Who's in charge of your life? Do you believe that he truly loves not only you, but the people you love even better than you love them? Can you trust God even when you don't understand what's happening and don't get the answers for all the whys in your life? Can you? How many of you have whys that you really would like the answers to? I do. Pick up the news. Watch some shows on murder. Why in the world did that person get killed? Why, God? French priest Jacques Philippe says, the worst that could ever happen to us is for everything to go right. Then our spiritual growth would never take place and we would never learn to lean on God. Sometimes I think, God, I don't want to lean on you that much. Could a few more things go right? Going through trials helps us locate our source of identity in God. But let's face it, none of us would choose them. Honestly, don't we have trouble turning our over things to God for two reasons? We're afraid God will take away something that we have, loss, or not give us something that we want, disappointment. This is a lack of faith in God's great love for us, a love that cannot be more powerfully demonstrated than what happened on the cross. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. We also don't have faith in God's wisdom and God's will. We don't completely believe that God knows best and is working so that all things do work together for our good. In truth, we don't want to lose control. We want to be our own God. And maybe that's why we have trouble going to sleep at night. Because we can't be in control. And we lay there at night worrying about the things that we have no control over. Worry is the opposite of faith. And that's because if we truly had faith, we would believe that our God is powerful, our God can still bring miraculous healing, often through people like Peter, we would believe that our God can heal not only broken bones and legs, but broken lives. And yes, even have faith knowing that our God is sometimes, 
probably more often than not beyond our human understanding. You know, King David didn't understand God either. And David's life and faith wasn't perfect. Yet in today's psalm, David shares his faith and trust in God. He says he knows the Lord hears him when he prays. He says, when you get ready for bed, search your heart and be silent. Good way to do that might be to go through your day and ask yourself, have I been angry, selfish, dishonest, jealous, fearful, irritable? Do I owe an apology? What did I do for others? What could I have done better? What did I do well? Where did I forget to ask for God's guidance and will? And then ask for forgiveness and be assured of God's love. Peter told the Jews in the temple, Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Take time to be thankful. David says, You have filled my heart with greater joy than when their grain and new wine abound. Finally, because he trusted in the Lord, he can say, I will lie down and sleep in peace. For you alone, O Lord, you alone make me dwell in safety. So, my friends, is he or isn't he your Savior and Lord, who you can trust and obey? Amen. Let us sing our sermon response. In the spirit of the first believers, we are called to share our goods in common and contribute to the needs of the poor with glad and generous hearts. We do this through our tithes and offerings to the church to financially support the mission and ministry of Hill Church. You are invited to place your offerings in the plate near the entrances, drop them off during the week, mail them to the church, or give electronically. Please rise in body or spirit as we join together in our unison prayer of dedication. Let us pray. God of all we are, all we have, and all we hope to be, we bring to you today a portion of that with which you have blessed us. We give as an act of gratitude to your generous provision. We give as an act of faith and trust in your power and love to provide for our future. We give as an act of obedience because you have called us to follow your example and to share what we have with others. We ask you to use and bless our gifts according to your will and to your glory. Amen.
just want to let you know that we're only going to sing one verse of the final hymn, being aware of the time. Uh, at this time, I invite you to share your joys and concerns. Anybody? Jamie Lynn. Um, the wasp. Uh, the wasp left this week. They'll be um, loading munitions this coming week on the um, in New Jersey. That's the ship that Nathaniel's assigned to. It's an amphibious assault ship. It has about a thousand sailors and about a thousand Marines on it and they are headed out to sea for the next 10 to 12 months. So if you could give your prayers to all of those men and women. Okay, uh, Jamie's son is on the WASP and um, they have thousands of uh, sailors and Marines and they're headed out for 10 to 12 months and we need to pray for them and all of those serving in the military, especially with some of the stuff going on in the Middle East. Um, any other people that want to share? Uh, yeah, I have a neighbor, an elderly neighbor, Sally Hughes, who has fallen and broken one arm and broken three fingers on her other hand, trying to take care of the, the yard. So prayers for her and her, her husband for the next uh, month and a half or so while they try to get over that. Okay, John. John's neighbor has fallen and broken an arm and fingers and needs some prayers. Any others? Yeah, please. Paskey? Patty? Paddocky. Okay. All right, anybody else? All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord God, we lift up today all those who are on our hearts and minds. You know who they are, even though their names may not be spoken. We pray for the family of Mary Pataki, and we thank you for her many, many years of service to this community through Meals on Wheels. And um, we pray that you comfort her family as um, they say goodbye to her. We pray for John's neighbor, and we pray that um, her arm and fingers will be healed quickly and that um, they'll be able to find help for all the things that are going to be affected by this injury. We also lift up all those who are serving above, uh, upon the WASP as it goes out to sea, and we lift up all of those that are serving in our military at this time, and we pray for their safety. We pray for the wisdom of their uh, commanders and the wisdom of our, our president and all those who are in a position to make def, uh, decisions that affect them and our nation. And um, most of all, we pray for peace in the world. And um, we pray that world leaders will find a way to make that a reality. We pray for those who are in nursing homes. Uh, we pray that um, they might find uh, healing and comfort there. Um, we pray for uh, those who are fighting uh, cancer, and we pray that their treatments will be effective, and uh, we pray for the families that are caring for them. We lift up all those we know who are chronically ill, and uh, we pray for those who are waiting for medical tests or going through treatments. Uh, all those things that affect the lives of so many families. And we pray for those who are going through uh, changes in their lives, some uh, that they're looking forward to and some that are unexpected and um, have uh, lasting effects on the family. 
Lord God, we just know that there's nothing that goes on in our lives that we cannot put into your hands. And we pray that we might um, have the peace that comes from knowing that you are in our lives and that we can take everything to you and that we can put our trust in you. And we pray this in the name of our Savior who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And let's just sing verse 1 of Trust and Obey. Beside us, 